this week in my study. I was reading from the book of Acts about the Apostle Paul's fourth myth missionary journey, which was actually the occasion when he was under arrest and being shipped from Jerusalem to Rome because he appealed his case before Caesar. And you can see on the board there, his missionary journey, hopefully those of you in Baton can see as well. The red line, he leaves Jerusalem, goes to Caesarea, and then boards a ship at Sidon, and makes his way across the Mediterranean Sea. Along the voyage to Rome, the ship on which he was being transported ran into severe weather, a northeastern storm passing through the region as they sailed around the Mediterranean, the Mediterranean island of Crete. You see there the Mediterranean Sea, the island of Crete there highlighted in the red. The storm increased as they tried to reach the harbor at Phoenix, not Phoenix, Arizona, but Phoenix on Crete, on the southwest side of Crete to ride out the storm. Phoenix was a safe harbor, a safe haven, to dock the ship and avoid a disastrous shipwreck. The crew on which Paul was sailing, with 276 people, frantically tried to make it to the safe harbor at Phoenix. I'll come back to the Apostle Paul in this event at the end of the lesson. But let me change gears here with you completely. Keep that in mind where the Apostle Paul is. On the Mediterranean Sea, on the ship, trying to make the safe harbor of Phoenix. Let me change gears here. I'll, I'll connect up with Paul again later. Our lesson this week in our ladies' Bible class was an excellent lesson on praising and worshiping God. In that lesson, lesson, the author, Cassandra Martin, made some very interesting observations about the benefits and blessings that we receive when we assemble together in worship to God. And I'd like to share them with you this morning. We are all aware of the uneasy times in our nation today. Rampant unrighteousness has permeated every facet of our society. One might call these times in which we live as tempestuous times or as the storms of life. Figuratively speaking, much like the tempestuous storm that the ship on which Paul was sailing through. Where is the safe harbor today? Where can we go to get relief from the storms of life that we all go through? Crisis in America puts a little bit of fear in all of us. Where can we go for that safe harbor? I want to submit to you today that the church as being that safe harbor, the people of God, especially when we come together and worship and have fellowship. This is our safe harbor in times of storm, in the times in which we live. This morning, I want to share with you the four R's of worshiping God that benefit and bless us. Number one, glorifying God in our worship refocuses our vision. Much of Cassandra Martin's book that we study in the ladies' Bible class, in fact, every chapter, talks about refocusing our vision to keep our eyes on Christ. We are constantly bombarded today by so many ungodly messages in the media, in conversations with other people, in what we read and what we hear. It is relentless, the ungodliness that we are exposed to today. We become desensitized to it much of the time, to our detriment when we 
get desensitized to these things. We need to fight against them. But it's hard for us to focus on what the Apostle Paul encourages us to think about. Remember in Philippians chapter 4 and verse 8, he says, Finally, brethren, whatever things are true, whatever things are noble, whatever things are just, whatever things are pure, whatever things are lovely, whatever things are of good report, if there is any virtue, if there is anything praiseworthy, think on these things. Oh, how hard that is in the life that we live, in these tempestuous times of life. When we assemble together for worship and fellowship with other saints, it is easier, probably the most easiest time we have all week, to refocus on God. And that's what we do in worship. The message is completely different. The message refreshes us. The sounds are different of singing praises to God. The faces we see are different. Smiles when we don't have our mask on. And smiles when we do have our mask on. Because we can see it in our eyes. Everything's different. It's peaceful in here, is it not? And we, we can focus on God. And most of all, God and Christ are present in fellowship with us in worship as we sit here today. And I hope you don't ever lose sight of that. They are here with us. And they are listening to our worship. And they are happy with us. And we are pleasing to God. And we can echo the words of the psalmist who said, I was glad when they said to me, let us go into the house of the Lord. Because that's our safe haven. That's where we can refocus on God without all that noise from outside. And we can think about God. It is in these times in worship and study of his word that our minds and our hearts are renewed by the knowledge of him who created us in his image. Romans chapter 12 verse 2 and Colossians 3 and verse 10. We are being refocused, renewed. Refreshed in worship. Secondly, glorifying God in our worship realigns our priorities in life. It is so easy in our busy lives to realign our priorities over and over and over again, sometimes several times a day. We're always realigning our priorities. What's important to us? What's most important? What's next important? And so forth. At times we get so busy that if we are not careful, we might realign God's place on the list of priorities downward and maybe even off the list completely if we're not careful. If we're not constantly thinking about God and who we are and who we belong to and what God expects of us, sometimes we push God down. Sometimes we even push God out. From time to time, all of us tend to move him downward, do we not? If we're honest with ourselves. Some of us may be in the process of doing that right now. And some of our brethren have done that already. And they move God off the list. He is no longer important to them. And they are not here anymore. They're out there in the world. Satan having won them over again and drawn them away from God. And sometimes it starts with those priority lists that we make day after day after day. Even on Sunday. Even on Wednesday. And pretty soon he's out. And we're gone. We need to be careful to remember what Jesus said in Matthew chapter 6 and verse 21 and 24. No one can serve two masters, for either he will hate the one and love the other, or else he will be loyal to one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and mammon. You cannot serve God wholeheartedly and keep one foot in the world. We can't do it. 
It's impossible. And coming to worship service and listen to what God has sacrificed for us on the cross and what he has provided for us eternal life in heaven through Jesus Christ, the forgiveness of sin, it helps us to realign our priorities and say, you know what? This is where I need to be. This is where I need to be. And I'm going to stop realigning the Lord downward and outward. But put him right up there at the top. By coming to God in prayer, study of his word, and singing, and remembering Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection, and communion, and in fellowship together, it helps us to refresh our memories on why God must, I put should, but it's the word must be first in our lives. We all have to work to survive and provide for our families. We all have to. And God knows that. And He expects us to provide for our families. We all have important things to do in everyday lives. And God knows that. There are some things that are very important. But there is nothing more important than God. When we neglect time to spend together and assembling with each other in worship and glorifying God, we do ourselves a great disservice. Not to mention sliding God. We're mindful of what the Hebrew writer says in Hebrews chapter 10, verse 24 and 25. Let us consider one another in order to stir up love and good works, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together as manner of some, but exhorting one another, and so much the more as you see the day approaching. Assembling together in worship to God helps us realign our priorities in life, to recognize and appreciate how wonderful our God and Father is to us. Glorifying God in our worship readjusts our perspectives in life. Things are out of control. <laughs> what a mess we are in. Where is God when we need Him? Have you ever heard phrases like these? Or maybe even said them yourself? I have. I think it was just last week I said, what a mess we are in. I think I said that maybe at Wednesday night Bible class or Tuesday night Bible study. These days we hear them a lot, don't we? But we can rest assured that God and Christ are in complete control. Complete control. They never relinquish control. Never have. Never will. I firmly believe that God allows certain things to happen in our life for a purpose. I firmly believe that. And there's evidence of that in the scripture. He allowed the flood to occur to cleanse the earth of unrighteousness so he could accomplish his will. He used the hard heart of Pharaoh. It was already hard. He used it to accomplish his will and bring about deliverance for his people out of Egyptian bondage. He allows things to occur. He allowed Job to suffer Physically in his flesh, materialistically in his livelihood, his family. He allowed all that to happen to teach Job how wonderful and great God is and to humble Job. He even allowed Jesus to die on the cross to bring about salvation for every one of us. Amen. He allows natural disasters in life to teach us that this life is temporary. When death occurs to one's loved ones, it teaches us how fragile and how precious life really is. When we lose our jobs or possessions in life, it teaches us to be more reliant on God and less on ourselves. Here are two passages 
that we can meditate on that will help us keep the right perspective in life. That God is in control and that he is watching out for each one of us. Romans chapter 8 verse 28, which we all know well. And we know that all things work together for good to those, and this is important, to those who love God, to those who are called according to his purpose. That doesn't mean everybody. This isn't a promise to everybody. He's writing, Paul is writing here to Christians in Rome. He's writing this to Christians in Merced. All things work together for good. To those that love God and those who are called according to his purpose. Those who are doing his will. All means all. All things. Tragedies in life. That come our way. God is watching over us, his people. And all of these things are going to work together for our good. Because our God and our Father is going to make sure that they do. And we need to start looking for those blessings. Instead of wallowing in the sorrow. And it's hard to do, especially when we lose love. Naturally, we're going to sorrow. Even Jesus wept. When his friend Lazarus died. He knew he was going to bring him back to life. But he saw the people around him. He was moved with emotion. Our Savior was a lot like us. He was moved with emotion. All things work together. For good to those that love God and are calling, called according to his purpose. That's a promise we have from God. That's a great promise. And here's another one. James chapter 1, 2 through 4. James says, By inspiration of God, my brethren, count it all joy when you fall into various trials. Really? Count it all joy? When I get COVID? Count it all joy? God is teaching us something. When we fall into various trials, knowing that the testing of your faith produces patience. But let patience have its perfect work, that you may be perfect and complete, lacking nothing. There's another promise of God. Through all these trials that we go through, through the tempestuous times we're living through, God is watching out for us. And it's going to turn out for our good so that we are lacking nothing. And on the other side of that, our faith is even stronger than it was before. That's God's intention. And if we are called according to his purpose and stay the course and follow Jesus, follow God, we are going to have greater faith because it's a promise. It's right there. When we assemble together and worship to God, we are reminded that our God, Almighty God, is in perfect control. He hasn't given it up. He hasn't taken a break. He hears our prayers. He will accomplish His will. Isaiah 55 and verse 11. His word does not come back to Him void. It's going to do what He set out for it to do. And He promises us that everything that happens to us, He will make to work out for our best for us, those who love Him and are called according to His purpose. So it helps us get our perspective on it. Come and worship. Glorifying God in worship reforms the contours of our hearts. When we worship and glorify God, we are reminded of the blessings, His blessings, and how blessed we are in Christ. Forgiven. Shown mercy. You ever think about mercy? I deserve death. You deserve death for sin. But God had mercy. He didn't give us what we deserve. Instead, he gave us overwhelming grace in Jesus. That's just to mention a few. There's many more spiritual blessings in Christ. And when we come to worship and we start singing and thinking about how much he's done for us. And what he has done for us. And how he's changed us. And forgiven us. And given us Jesus. It softens our hearts. It humbles our hearts. It softens us. 
when we forsake or neglect the opportunities to worship and praise God, the harder our hearts tend to become. This can and does happen sometimes to our brethren, and soon they drift away, their faith grows weaker and weaker, and it becomes harder and harder for them to come back to the Lord because their hearts have grown hard because they haven't been around God's people. They haven't been studying God's word. They haven't been listening to a different message. They've listened to the message of the world, which will harden anybody. We have to get close to God in worship and draw close to Him. Hebrews chapter 6, verses 4 through the first part of 6. It is impossible for those who once were enlightened and have tasted that heavenly gift and become partakers of the Holy Spirit and have tasted the good word of God and the powers of the age to come. If they fall away, which is possible, to renew them again to repentance. You can become so hard by neglecting God that it's going to be impossible for you to come back. Not because God doesn't want you back. It's because you don't want Him back in your life. You become so hard-hearted. And it's impossible to come back. Ah, that's scary. When we come together to worship on Sundays, Bible class, before worship, on Tuesday, to Bible class on Tuesdays, and fellowship in Bible class on Wednesday, we are reminded of how blessed we are and how special we are to God. Ephesians 1 and verse 3, all spiritual blessings are in Christ Jesus. Oh, how He loves us. He loves us so much. And it touches our hearts when we think about that. And it melts our hardness away and draws us closer to God. God's glory and creation. God, glorifying God in worship and praise to Him is what God has created us to do. Everything else doesn't matter. That's what we've been created to do. We are created in His image to be like Him. Romans 8 and verse 29. He gave us his son Jesus as the perfect example, the perfect image of God, Hebrews 1 3. The perfect living, breathing, walking, talking example of God for us to imitate and follow. He gave us Jesus, and we are his creation. Created in the image of God to glorify, magnify, and praise His name. And we do that in worship. And getting together in fellowship to study. And draw closer to God and closer to each other. So in conclusion, when we assemble to worship God and study His word, we receive four benefits in return. Our vision is refocused on the greatness of God and Christ Jesus. Our priorities are realigned to where they should be, God first in our lives. Our perspective in life is readjusted. God is in control. We have no reason to worry. God will take care of us and always does. And our contours of our heart are reformed. We are softened and made whole again. And we're going to leave here that way today. Because of God and His great love for us. Back to Paul on that ship headed to Rome, <laughs> trying to make that safe harbor in the storm. The ship was not able to make that harbor. It was carrying about at sea for days, and eventually it became shipwrecked. If we fail to make the safe harbor of worshiping God and praising Him during the tempestuous times in which we live, our faith will be shipwrecked and we will lose it. 
and some have already been lost because they didn't rely on God. They listened to the noise of the world. And they grew weaker and harder and they're gone. Whether they're gone so much that we can't get them back or they can't come back, I don't know. We need to keep trying to bring them back to the safe haven so they won't be lost eternally. But that's how it happens. That's how it happens. And God does not want that to happen to any of us. He is not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. And he's long suffering. He keeps giving us time <coughs> to do that. Thank God for his love, his mercy, his grace, his long suffering towards us. If you're here today and your faith is shipwrecked or in danger of being shipwrecked, then rededicate your life to the Lord this morning. Get back on God's ship. In the tempestuous times in which we live, we need Him. More than ever, we need Him. The world is dragging us, is calling us to follow it. And here is God <coughs> calling us. Stay with me. Don't go there. Don't even test the waters. You'll end up shipwrecked. You're here this morning, and you're a, fi a child of God. You haven't been right with God. Make that right with the Lord this morning. And leave this building refreshed, knowing that you're back on the ship again, <laughs> on the right ship. If you're here this morning, and you haven't even gotten on the ship yet, you're still on the dock in the world. And the storm is brewing all around you. What are you going to do? I tell you what you need to do. You need to obey the gospel of Jesus Christ. You need to believe in Him. You need to confess that He is the Son of God. You need to repent of following the ways of the world and follow Jesus. You need to be baptized into Christ, immersed in water, raised to newness of life, which is how you get on the ship. Because the ship is Christ. And you need to be in Christ. To weather the storm all the way to the end. In Christ is that safe haven. In Christ is your safe harbor. In his body, the church, we're all in that safe harbor with him. Weathering the storm. Storms of life. You don't stand a chance outside of Christ. Not a chance. Not a chance. It's going to get you. You'll be lost. Don't be lost. God doesn't want you to be lost. He's pleading with you through me, through the word, through all of us singing the invitation song. Come to me. I'll save you. Come to me. If you need to respond to the Lord's invitation this morning, do so right now while we stand and while we sing.